Welcome to Cool Talk. Today we talk about the Middle Ages. And what are the Middle Ages? Well, remember in previous videos that the Roman Empire was split in two, the West and the East. Western Roman Empire fell and the Eastern Roman Empire went on for about a thousand years, the Byzantium Empire. Well, between the time of the fall of the West to the time of the fall of the East is known as the Middle Ages, about a thousand years. We have spoken about pagan invasions, and look how pagan invasions affected the English language. You can pause here and see how all the days of the week reflect in either Old English or the name of mythological gods. When the pagans invaded the West, the emperors lost a lot of power. Now, when these changes happen, it affects the rich more than the poor. The poor go on living simple lives, but as emperors lose power, there is chaos and crime, and little protection from bandits and raiding smaller tribes. And this is when the church stepped in to fill the vacuum. Around 590, Pope Gregory supervised the police, directed an army, coined money, and the infrastructure was improved, especially the building of aqueducts. And the church also sent missionaries out to spread Christianity. Monks preserved culture by record-keeping and translating the Bible. Monasteries served as hospitals and hostels, and the church was a sanctuary for those fleeing for their lives. In the later part of the 5th century, another German tribe, the Franks, led by Clovis, took parts of Gaul. Now, Clovis and his men were Roman Catholics, and Gaul was full of Aryan Christians that were considered, considered heretics by the church. So the Pope gave his blessing. So when Clovis and his men took over Gaul, they extended the Pope's authority. Clovis died in 511. While the church extended its dominion, there was a lot of persecution of the Jews in Western Europe. The church agreed that Jews had to suffer for the killing of Jesus hundreds of years earlier, that though perhaps forgiven by God, it was just that they should suffer. And this was the official position of the Roman Catholic Church until 1973. In 714, Charles became emperor of the Frankish lands. He pushed back the Muslim invaders from Spain and saved Europe for Christianity. He became known as Charles Martel, Charles the Hammer. Now, though the Muslims predominate a lot in this video of the Middle Ages, I have to discuss the rise of Islam in a separate video because of lack of time, but we'll get to that. The capital of the Byzantium Empire is Constantinople, today known as Istanbul, and I cannot overstate its importance. It was the bridge between the trade in the East and the West, but also it was the only barrier to keep the Muslims and the Turks away from Western Europe. Its importance cannot be overstated. In the year 711, Caliph Yazid, a Muslim who had taken over some Byzantium territory, ordered the destruction of statues and paintings. This destruction of idols is called iconoclasm. The Christians freaked out. Now, Emperor Constantine VI, the Byzantium emperor, came into power, but he was just a boy. So his mother Irene governed for him. When the boy became of age, he wanted to pack the churches full of statues and paintings. His mother Irene disagreed, and she was such a zealot that she had her son's eyes pulled out. The Frankish Emperor Charles Martel, his son Pepin, becomes king. He leads an army against the Lombards in Italy, and when he wins, he gives a huge portion of Italy to the church. These were known as the Papal States. When Pepin died, his son Charles, Charles the Great, or as the French called him, Charlemagne, becomes emperor. He was a giant of a man, six feet, four inches tall. He wanted to marry Irene, the Byzantium emperor's mother. She was intrigued, but her court was not. They put her in a nunnery. And Charlemagne was angry, so he formed an alliance with Baghdad against Constantinople. Now remember, the Western Europeans were Roman Catholic and they spoke Latin. The Byzantines spoke 
Greek, and they were Greek Orthodox. There were a lot of divisions going on at the time, and they didn't like each other. Now, Charlemagne conquered nation after nation until he acquired land that rivaled the size of the old Western Roman Empire. Charlemagne sent priests out to convert. He organized counties. He appointed counts to maintain order. He was a strong believer in education and preserving the Roman culture. This was good because before him, the church only allowed monks to study and pagan books had been burned as heresy, even classics from Greece and Rome. Charlemagne brought in scholars from other places and there was a rebirth in learning. But after Charlemagne's death, uh, the empire began to crumble under the assault of Viking invasions. Now, one tribe among the Vikings were the Normans. They were tough. They stayed in France, built castles, married the local girls, and promised to protect the king against other Viking invasions. Now, the Normans established the city of Normandy. And you'll remember Normandy during World War II because of the D-Day invasion. Then there were the Slavs tribal people that attacked and took over areas in Hungary and Russia. Now, I do realize that with all these invasions going back and forth, it can be confusing, but the Middle Ages was a time of chaos, and yes, it can be hard to follow. And now it's time to talk about the system that came about, feudalism. Without a central government and the emperors losing power, nobles became independent. They owned lots of land, and each land plot was known as a fief. Now, when the Lord, which is not the Lord God, but a Lord, a title, re received a fief, nobles under him pledged loyalty to him for that land. They kept the peace for themselves, they promised to administer the land for the Lord, and they became vassals to that land. And there were peasants that were called serfs. They worked the land for the Lord and kept a little plot to work on for themselves. They were slaves in everything but name, working all the time. But the land was very self-contained. You could get wool, grain, pork. Uh, the woodlands provided fuel. It was very self-contained and many serfs never left the land to travel, their whole lives being spent on these few hundred acres. And of course, you needed knights to protect these lands. And along with the serfs, the feudalism system needed administrators, police, collectors, and surveyors. They were stewards, bailiffs, reeves, assistants, and as I mentioned, knights to fight for the Lord if need be. And knights needed squires and horses. Now, because the lords of these fiefs would tithe money or give lands to the church, the church became extremely wealthy and very, very powerful. They revived schools and formed universities. And then came a new group, the merchant, that would form a new middle class. In spite of the power of the church and the nobility, craftsmen such as weavers and carpenters and merchants with trade association, associations known as guilds, rivaled some of these nobles in wealth. You see, the feudal areas were very self-contained and had a little part in trade. The Muslims were choking the waterways in the Mediterranean, except for the Venetians. The Venetians' salt fish trade was huge, and in a century, the Italian ships were calling at many Mediterranean ports. And with the growth of these seaports came trade fairs. Commercial laws were made to settle disputes. And the trade fairs were instrumental in developing a money economy where money changes were made at booths. The Lombards, the Florentines, they were among the first to develop and expand the mercantile and banking system. And outside of the feudal areas, villages and towns grew, and they became, later on, cities. Now, this new middle class was known as the bourgeoisie. And though the nobles and lords looked down upon them, what occurred now was that money, instead of birth, determined class distinction. The Arabs influenced European culture. We had Arabic numbers, algebra, trigonometry. And when it came to navigation, we had the ship rudder and the mariner's compass. There were literary epics such as Beowulf and El Cid. There was Chaucer's Canterbury Tales, Dante's The Divine Comedy, a new style of Romanesque architecture, Gothic. And then came scholasticism. It was a use of logic and philosophy to be applied to church teachings. 
A tribal people probably from Asia migrated to an area that would be known as a new nation, Russia. These people that migrated there were the Slavs. Some went to the Balkan areas, some to Czechoslovakia and Poland, but the Eastern Slavs went to Russia. They settled between the Baltic and Black Sea. They farmed, hunted, and fished. The Byzantium Empire traded wine, silk, fruit, and glassware for Russian fur, honey, and fish. Many city-states were formed, but there was no central government. However, merchants flourished and money poured in. The Russians became Greek Orthodox, and Yaroslav the Wise of Kiev, the Russian emperor, married his daughters off to the kings of Hungary, France, and Norway, and a sister was married off to the king of Poland. He defeats the rivals around him, and he was at the height of his powers. A federation of nations known as Kievan Rus was formed, and eventually the name would become Russia. Now, in 1014, the Bulgars, a tribe, was trying to invade Constantinople, and the Byzantine Emperor Basile was tired. He captured 15,000 Bulgar prisoners of war, and rather than keep them, he decided to send a message. He divided the 15,000 into groups of 100 each. He had 99 of each 100 blinded, and the last person was allowed to keep one eye. So the groups were sent home, 150 groups of 99 blind men being led by a one-eyed man. When the 15,000 arrived in Bulgaria, the Bulgarian Tsar Samuel fell into a coma and died. Bulgaria gave no more trouble after that. Now the Germans, the Byzantines, and even Venice attacked and captured many Slavs. The Slavs were used as slaves. The city of Bari, Italy, became a slave market, and Venice had many buildings raised along its famous canals built by these same slaves. And you probably already figured it out. The word Slav became the root of the English word slave. In the 1200s were many invasions by the Mongols. Now, one Mongol who went over to Moscow was Timur the Lame, or as he is better known, Tamerlane. It would be a couple of hundred years before the Mongols were gone from that area. Now, Spain had been taken over by the Muslims, but the Christians that were there were allowed to stay. And the Caliph, Abdar Rahman III, was afraid that the Christians were going to rebel. So he decides to help the Christian Prince of Leon, Sancho the Fat, to get back on the throne where he had been overthrown. He assists him. They take the city of Zamora and then Leon. Sancho the Fat, however, would betray Abdar Rahman III. Sancho the Fat would be poisoned by his brother, and his brother would take the throne. Now, this is Robert Guiscard. He was a Norman who would be known by his nickname Robert the Weasel. He acquired an army, invaded Italy, and kidnapped the Pope. And he wouldn't let the Pope go until the Pope crowned him King of Calabria. Calabria is in the toe part of the map of Italy. Many were angry at the Pope, and this furthered the strain between the Western and Eastern Europeans. Now, Robert gets a divorce. He had fallen in love with a giant six-foot woman named Sakil Gaita, and she fought next to him in battle. They overran the city of Bari, Italy, invaded Greece, and won, but they had suffered great losses, so they returned to Italy. He wanted to invade Constantinople, and he had the Pope's blessings. But when Robert decided to go and plunder Rome, like few had plundered the city before, the Pope withdrew his support. Robert the Weasel died in 1085, and five years later, his brother Roger had added Sicily to the realm. Now, the Byzantium Emperor Alexius Comnenus sends word to the Pope that he needed help. He wanted to regain some lands that he had lost. In exchange for some of this help, he would help the Western Europeans regain Jerusalem, which had fallen in the hands of the Muslims. So the Pope, in 1095, Pope Urban II calls for the liberation of Jerusalem. This would be the beginning of the Crusades, to free the Holy Land, which was in the hands of the Muslims. It would be a tremendous announcement that would change Europe. 
It was the call for the first crusade, and the amount of knights who joined was overwhelming. They would rid the holy land of the infidels, gain riches both on earth and in heaven. So men sold their homes, sold everything to buy supplies, horses, etc., so they could go. So the price of homes went sky high, and the economy was chaotic. Inflation skyrocketed. But before they got rid of the infidels in the Holy Land, they decided to get rid of who they called infidels at home, the Jews, who suffered many massacres in their villages. So the Crusaders marched off, and before reaching Jerusalem, instead of helping the Byzantium Emperor Alexius, as promised, they squabbled with him, and some of them attacked the Byzantiums. There was war between the Greeks and the Franks. Some crusaders captured Armenia and kept it for themselves. But finally, in 1099, they reached Jerusalem. They stormed the walls and in the name of Jesus, killed every Muslim man, woman, and child in the city. 40,000 people. They won. They also changed all the Greek Orthodox priests in the area for Roman Catholic ones. They built massive castles, feudalized Syria and Palestine, and learned to live with the Muslim neighbors. The First Crusade opened the eyes of Europe to a new culture, philosophy, new schools, translations of books, and also a new phenomenon, the educated woman, such as Ildgard von Bingen, writer, philosopher, preacher, who wrote music and wrote an encyclopedia of herbs, and Eleanor of Aquitaine, a queen consort of France, a powerful, very wealthy woman who sponsored many literary figures. She even led armies. There were crusades within Europe, such as the crusade against the Bosnian church, which was loaded with Cathars. Cathars were considered heretics. There was also the Reconquista in Spain. Spain had been taken over by the Muslims. It would take centuries to get them out and finally happened in 1492. Now, when the county of Edessa, which was near Jerusalem, had been attacked and taken by the Seljuk Turks, there was a second crusade called. And when the crusaders reached the Byzantine territory of Anatolia, the Emperor Manuel refused to help them. Possibly he even assisted the Turks in attacking them. At any rate, the crusaders failed and the Muslims got stronger. You see, King Manuel had made a peace treaty with the Turks. And now that he saw that Western Europe was weak, he attacked the Venetian army. The Turks suddenly saw him as a threat. They went over and wiped out his army. When King Manuel dies, his sons got challenged by the Greek Orthodox because their mother was a Roman Catholic Frankish woman. So there was a civil war in Constantinople and 10,000 Franks were killed. The Empress had to pawn her jewelry in Venice, and the Byzantium Empire was broke. In 1187, a new Muslim leader would arise, and he wanted to oust the Crusaders out of the Holy Land. Ibn Ayyub seized power and takes the name of Saladin. He becomes the Sultan of Egypt and Syria and Kurdistan, and then attacks Jerusalem. The Europeans launched a third crusade, and famous crusaders were participate, such as Philip Augustus from France and Richard the Lionheart from England. When Saladin reached Jerusalem, the Byzantium army believed that God was on their side. They decided to attack Saladin out in the open, away from the fortified walls. They were massacred, and in July of 1187, Saladin enters Jerusalem, takes the city, and kills no one. During this period, Jews were being either killed or chased off, definitely persecuted. In Venice, Jewish men had to wear red hats. They became tax collectors, lenders, and financiers, and uh, they lent money on interest, became very rich. At one point, Jews were said to have controlled over half the coin in England. A few years later, there was a fourth crusade. It was called by Pope Innocent III, and his purpose was to oust the Muslims from Egypt and then recapture the city of Jerusalem. But it was a disaster in so many ways, and it only ended up getting Christians to fight each other. Let me explain. 
The Crusaders go to Venice and they order the building of several ships to transport 35,000 men and 5,000 horses for the crusade. In Venice, they make the deal with the Duke of Venice, Enrico Dandolo. Dandolo builds the ships, but the crusaders fail to get enough men and funding to pay him back. So they had no money. Well, what to do? Well, Dandolo says, no problem. I know where the money is. So they decide to attack the city of Zara, which had Cathars living there, heretics. They could go there, kill the Cathars, sack the city for gold. And they do, but there wasn't much money there. So now what? Well, Dandolo continues to guide them. Now keep in mind that he is 85 years old and completely blind. They meet up with the Byzantine prince Alexios Angelo, who convinces them that if they put his family back on the throne in Constantinople, he would pay them. So they do, but he doesn't. He doesn't pay them, so they get angry, and they invade Constantinople, and they plunder, they rape, and they kill. They end up dividing the Byzantine Empire, putting a Frank to be the new king. Venice takes almost half of the empire. The rest is divided up among barons. The Pope gets angry at this turn of events and excommunicates all the Crusaders, and the Byzantine Empire is now considerably weaker. But Duke Enrico Dandolo gets paid his money and he goes home happy. In the year 1212, there was the Children's Crusade, the idea being that God would protect these little ones. So these children marched from Germany to Genoa, and when they got there, they were exhausted. Some French picked them up, loaded them on ships, took their money, and sold them as slaves in North Africa. In the coming years, King John of England, the unpopular king, would sign the Magna Carta, guaranteeing some rights to his people. And the Greek Orthodox took back Constantinople. In Northern Asia, during an especially cold winter, rats moved south and they carried on their backs fleas with a bacteria. This was the Black Plague. And when it spread through Asia and then through Europe and Africa, it killed between 75 to 200 million people, about 30 to 60 percent of Europe's population. The disease would start with swelling, then fevers and vomiting, and then death. Europeans thought that it was the apocalypse, that the end of the world was near. There was religious fanaticism, penances, and flagellation going on all around, but nothing worked. The doctors were at a loss. So, when something like this happens, what do you do? You blame the Jews. And there was Jewish massacres, entire communities. 210 Jewish communities were destroyed, and the Jews ran off to Poland. Remember the movie Braveheart? Good movie, I liked it, but it was very historically inaccurate. In the movie, William Wallace, a Scottish rebel, fights the English, but he becomes the lover of Princess Isabella of France, who was married to Prince Edward II of England, who happened to be gay. In the movie, she gets pregnant, and it's assumed that it is William Wallace's baby. The truth is that the princess was only 10 years old when William Wallace was executed. She married Edward II, who may or may not have been gay, and she got married at the age of 13. What we can know from all of this, and sorry Braveheart fans, but the baby is probably his. And the son's name would be Edward III. And when Edward III becomes king of England, he decided that because his mother was a French princess, the throne of France was his too. So he attacks France. And so begins the 100 years war between England and France. It was actually a series of wars that in the end produced nothing. England never took over France. We all know that the British, with all their fine manners, are tough. But whenever somebody criticizes the French and calls them wussies, tell them that the French fought the British for 100 years and won. And we need to mention Joan of Arc, the French peasant girl who saw visions and led the French army in many battles. She would be captured by the English, accused of witchcraft, and burnt at the stake at the age of 19. And in 1453 occurred the unthinkable, Constantinople, the walled city that stood as unconquerable with its thick walls and barricades and river borders, fell to the Turks. 
Sultan Mehmet II attacked the city on May 29, 1453, and 53 days later took over. The last Byzantium emperor, Constantine XI, refused to sneak out of the city. He fought with his men to the very end, and his body was never found. So now, Western Europe, that disliked the Byzantium Empire, yet counted on them to keep the invaders out, could count on them no more. There was no longer a Byzantium Empire, and not only that, but the Turks now held Constantinople, the bridge to Asia, and all the spice trades that came through it. It could strangle Europe by controlling the trade routes. The Middle Ages had ended, and Europe would have to pay the Turks whatever they wanted for spices and goods, or starve if the Turks didn't allow it. Europe would have to find another way to reach Asia. And Christopher Columbus would later promise to do exactly that. But at this moment in 1453, he's only two years old. We'll talk about Columbus in a later video with the age of exploration. But my next video is Mohammed and the rise of Islam. Until then, comment below or better yet, subscribe. This is Cool Talk.